have you all here tonight for our second event since the COVID break. Uh, my name is Rich Brubaker and I'm the founder of Collective Responsibility. I have brought this together in partnership with WeWork. Tonight's really about our event series where we are trying to engage the community, not just in terms of education, but also in terms of business practice sharing, also inspiring everyone to think about how entrepreneurs, innovators, and people inside the companies can basically bring sustainability from within and take it to scale in China. 2060 Goals in China was actually our last conversation, and a lot of it revolved around the role of cities, energy, and a little bit of building efficiency. Tonight we're not talking about that. We're talking about hydrogen, we're talking about solar, we're talking about efficiency, we're talking about innovation. And we're really lucky to have a great panel of speakers. Before I get to that, I'd just like to introduce our sponsor, WeWork, tonight. They're hosting us. Uh, they're very gracious, partly because I'm paying a lot of rent upstairs, uh, but also because they're, they're really just a great group. Um, they take up sustainability really well. They usually do a pitch, but they let me do it for them. So with that, we have three great speakers tonight. Um, I'm really excited because I've known two of these individuals for a while, and Peter's a new addition to the group and Peter works on hydrogen, which is a topic that I really know nothing about, and I'm very excited to learn more about. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring up Andy. If Excellent. If you don't know Andy Klump, he's been here a long time. I will let them each introduce themselves because they're much better at it than I am. Excellent, thank you, thank you Richard. Sir. So that one right there. Richard and I also share a, a hometown of St. Louis, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, is in the Midwest of the United States. So uh, I'm very excited to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing at CEA. Uh, just to give a little background on myself, um, I've been living in and working in China for the last uh, 18 years, uh, going on 20. It was actually technically uh, 2001 was my first trip here. I lived in Shanghai in 02, and then worked uh, for Dell Computer in Beijing for, uh, for a little while. And then I shifted from, clean, from high tech to clean tech in 2006. So I was actually uh, at Trina Solar, part of their IPO, uh, as you see in the New York Stock Exchange in 2006. Stay there for two years as the company scaled up about 10x, and then I founded uh, my firm CEA. So we've been active uh, in China since uh, day one. Um, re recently, this was a uh, picture of my uh, interview by CNBC. Uh, we put all of our podcasts and other content online, so feel free to, uh, to check it out if you'd like. Just as a firm, what we do, we really focused on kind of four core areas. One, we provide a lot of, uh, we basically help people buy things. Uh, so that's our supply chain management practice. We then have a team that focuses on doing the quality checks in the factory. We then have another team that sits at the system level. And so as we deploy solar and energy storage, they actually do uh, quality checks in the field. Uh, that's our engineering services team. And then finally, we have a market intelligence platform for all the work that we do. So in aggregate, we've done about uh, 85 gigawatts worth of work in the solar industry and about four gigawatt hours in, uh, in energy storage. So uh, our clients represent about 62 countries globally, and we've had uh, our teams in about 13 countries, but we're uh, 145 of which 115 are either inspectors or engineers. We ourselves do practice what we preach, and so our core purpose uh, is very clear. Uh, we believe that by helping our clients and stakeholders deploy solar and storage solutions worldwide, we're creating a better future. This is something I talk with my team about on a regular basis. Every month I have an all-hands meeting, uh, every quarter we update our numbers, we see the positive impact we're having in the world. And I think everyone who's at CA knows that we're a very culture-driven organization and uh, this has been one of our differentiators. So getting key talent is one of the keys to uh, growing good companies. But uh, enough about my business, uh, let's talk about the uh, overall uh, energy business. I think all of us are clearly aware uh, where the, uh, the, the old trends used to be. Uh, but once again, where do we see the world moving towards? Uh, it's, it's absolutely uh, great to see uh, Richard's graph. I'll show you a little bit different one in the next slide. But you know, I think the, the awareness of climate change is much more front and center. Everyone is very clear about where, uh, where there's positive public awareness of the need for renewables. And we're actually seeing this, um, seeing this happen. So if I, um, you know, this, this graph starts in 2016, but if I actually had to pull it back even further, once again, we would know that you know, for energy, everyone was using wood way back when, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, so for many centuries. But it was really uh, still dominated even as of five years ago uh, on thermal. 
but we've seen a dramatic change in many different markets. Now, this, uh, this projection is looking out you know, a little more bullish than I think what Richard's graph was, but by 2050, there are a lot of other folks who will say, look, 50% of the world's energy will be generated by wind and solar. And if you add in hydro and a few others, you know, we're getting the 60, uh, 60 and change, you know, close to two thirds. I think those are very achievable numbers provided we have energy storage. So energy storage is one of the newer areas of our practice. We've been working on this the last five plus years, but I'll show you some of the slides like why this uh, trend has been happening. But I think one of the key points is if you look at all of the recent expansion just in the last five years in certain markets like the US, almost all of it has been wind and solar. And if you look at the growth in China, it's, you know, it's dramatic. Um, so I think that the China number that Richard showed is much, much too, uh, too uh, uh, conservative. I think the China market's gonna be at least 25, if not 30% solar by 2050. And I think there's uh, potential for you even to be greater. So especially if they're talking about, uh, I, I just don't think they can pull off as large an expansion on nuclear. Uh, I think nuclear may grow in China, but I think just broadly defined globally, I don't think nuclear is gonna expand that much. That's why if you look at uh, nuclear here, it still is a very, uh, very small fraction of, of what we're talking about. If I have to look at the causes for this though, uh, it's clear the massive amount of uh, change that's happened. I mean, I joined the solar industry 15 years ago Back in the day, solar was just a, you know, I kind of refer to as the tree hugger industry. Um, the total global solar market was roughly 1.6 gigawatts. So the industry is, is pretty, uh, uh, pretty basic. They measure everything in terms of watts uh, DC, uh, but the 1.6 gigawatts was a global number. Now we have projects that are effectively on a standalone basis that size. But uh, what, what effectively happened, if we looked at the selling price of a module, in 2006, when I joined the industry, the selling price was about $3.25. And then because of a shortage, one of the key raw materials, uh, polysilicon, actually raised in price all the way up to $4.75 a watt in 2008. So from that peak, we actually seen pricing drop by 95%. So, and the industry has effectively scaled about 100x. So we closed last year at roughly about 160 gigawatts. So it's a much, much larger industry, and that's what's allowed the cost to keep coming down. Now, what, what if you look at um, this kind of overall projection, what's really interesting is that once again, you're taking the same core product, and depending on where you install it, you have massively different cost structures. So when you're producing energy, one would think, okay, the Middle East, that's the best place. So actually, not really, because at certain parts of the Middle East, you're having average temperatures at 45 degrees uh, Celsius, Solar does not have as high of an output uh, at that point in time. You actually do have some temperature coefficients that do negatively impact the output of the panels. But if you have a slightly cooler region, but you know, still with a lot of sun, it's optimal. You can actually produce much more. So when everyone's looking at what the cost is, I mean, this is, some of these are you know, asymptotic lines, but, but very close to approaching, you know, a, I would say free energy. But you know, we have had cases where you've had in the Middle East costs that are actually bid at uh, you know, roughly one cent a watt. So that's virtually no profit, but it's just such a large project and installation that um, you know, many parties just you know, went after it. But the costs have come down dramatically and they're gonna con continue to come down. So if you uh, do some comparison, um, there's a concept called uh, grid parity. So in the US, uh, which is what this levelized cost of electricity map is referencing, uh, for many, many years, solar was just, you know, 10 to 20x what every other form of conventional, you know, combined cycle, uh, you, know, you know, gas combined cycle uh, program or any, any other thermal source of energy. But really what we've now seen is that now at utility scale level, we're, we're actually at grid parity. So it's actually less expensive to actually deploy solar than use conventional energy. And that's the point that has really tipped the scales and cause the industry to really skyrocket. Um, this is just another forecasted grid parity slide, but once again, I think you know, there's, there's many different analysis we can look at. Uh, it's not just one one-off uh, group that's saying that solar and wind can be uh, 50%. I think it's, it's really a much more common held belief because costs are still coming down. And we also now have seen that, once again, the cumulative uh, impact of capacity, I mean, once again, by 2050, uh, the US alone will about probably be at 
And mind you, almost all of that is coming from coal and natural, even natural gas. So coal in the U.S. up until 2015 was, was over 30 percent. Historically, it was you know, 50, 50 to 60 percent. Uh, and now it's actually come down less than 20 percent during COVID. And what's interesting during COVID is that in the U.S. particularly is that uh, the overall energy demand actually dropped. And despite what you might think, the proportion of coal dropped much more dramatically because all the wind and solar facilities were already financed and that feedstock is free, the sun's still shining. The coal, they still had to buy the incremental amount of coal to fuel all the, all the furnaces. So effectively, those were the first ones to drop because they had to pay some incremental amount of money, but all the, uh, the solar uh, and renewable facilities basically had a higher share. And I think that trend's only gonna continue. So I think one of the other key uh, trends uh, is really about the uptick of overall uh, you know, global demand, but a lot of it's been driven by corporates. So it's a really interesting phenomenon at the uh, Trump administration in the U.S. Um, first of all, I never voted for Trump, so can't say that was, uh, that was uh, my, my fair doing. But in 2016, he was voted up, and there were a lot of anti-Trump forces that said, hey, we've got to push the industry forward. So the industry actually grew through the Trump administration despite some of his policies and the increasing tariffs, but a lot of it came down from corporates. So we actually uh, do work with some of the companies here on this graph, uh, and I will say they are very committed. Once again, the, the RE100 is a very powerful group of corporate buyers who are committed to 100% renewable energy. Some have already hit their targets, some like Microsoft and Google have done this, and now they're going back, and Microsoft said, we're gonna be carbon neutral back to the time we started. So they're actually dating themselves by 40 years and saying we're going back in time and gonna undo all that uh, carbon heavy energy that we consumed. So uh, demand for corporates is, uh, is through the roof. And then, uh, you know, once again, the other pairing of uh, solar is uh, energy storage. So uh, energy storage systems have deployed quite dramatically the last couple of years, but these are only gonna increase. I think some of the financing of these projects this first projection have kind of pushed out a little bit, but um, pretty much all of the projects that we're seeing in the U.S. right now are solar and storage combinations. So the, this trend is only going to continue. And the same phenomenon is here as well. Is once again, it's the, it's the cost curve. So I, my first uh, facility, uh, energy storage facility I visited was in uh, 2011. And then we started to, I just was kind of interested, you know, looking at, uh, at, at some of the technology. Then we had clients calling us in 2014, and so we started a team in 2015, led by George Tolupis, our Director of Technology and Quality, and so he started to put a program together. And really the last two to three years, we just saw a dramatic increase in a demand for our business, so we've added folks to our team. But energy storage costs have come down dramatically, and the supply chains have gotten a lot, uh, lot more competitive, and they're also diversifying away from some of the higher cost components. So this is what's driving uh, a massive growth. But if you think about energy storage, at the end of the day, it's just a gnat on the back of an elephant. And that giant elephant is the electric vehicle market. So electric vehicles are really what's uh, driving the overall growth in the core chemistry. But the deployment of, uh, of energy storage is only gonna increase country by country. And once again, if you see the top of the list, you know, it's China. You know, the U.S. and India are still uh, behind, but uh, you know, many other countries in Europe are uh, deploying uh, at a pretty, pretty heavy clip. Uh, and so we're going to see the energy storage market grow. Uh, but once again, it's really the electric vehicle segment, which is really driving the overall market. And so as we see more and more new cars come uh, and be adopted, we're, um, we're going to see this trend uh, just move forward. So um, I'm not going to talk as much about this. You know, obviously, you have to have the electrification uh, infrastructure to support all the electric vehicles. And uh, increasingly, we're going to see just multiple supply chains that uh, support uh, broader electrification. So increasingly, there are more and more residential solar companies that are combining EV charging as a package. And actually, uh, you know, Tesla is a perfect example of that. So the Tesla Powerwall has a very high uh, share market in the U.S. and, and in, in increasing many other markets. So I, I just want to kind of close on like, you know, what is it that's going to debunk, uh, you know, the current trends? And, you know, there have been some concerns about panel waste. I think this is a fairly minor issue. Um, there are some recycling programs in place, but the reality is there's not a lot of cases of solar breaking down. 
all the products are, uh, are effectively warrantied for 25 years, but the useful life is 40 plus. There are plenty of panels that were produced in the uh, 50s or 60s that are actually still producing today. It's just uh, the, they're getting better, um, but there can be quality issues. And so this is part of the work we do on the quality front. We've actually had some of our clients who've go withstood uh, hurricane you know, forces and, and strong winds and actually still maintain uh, strong integrity. But if you don't have, uh, you know, some for storms are severe enough, they'll just wipe away a solar field. But if you don't have the right specifications or don't work with the right manufacturers, then that can actually result in, uh, in problems. Uh, I think this by far is the biggest issue facing the industry is the fact that one has to finance these projects up front. So you cannot do this without a strong financing partner. And that is effectively a positive when interest rates are low, but what's potentially gonna happen in the next year or two due to all the liquidity being brought in by the market is that we're gonna see inflation. And so with higher interest rates, you're not gonna have the same low cost of capital. It'll be harder to deploy a lot of these, uh, you know, these, these projects. Uh, I think there's, there certainly are some folks who uh, are not giving out good information on the industry. I think this is a relatively small minor point, but uh, I always enjoy talking with folks who are unfamiliar with the industry and trying to educate them on what, uh, what is going on in, the, in this sector. One of the big myths is it costs, it takes a lot more energy to produce solar panels than it used to, but I can assure you 15 years ago when I went into the industry, it was about a two and a half year energy neutral payback period. Now it's less than, less than six months. So the efficiency of the use of the inbound energy is, is increasing, thereby declining the energy payback uh, period. And then uh, once again, I think, you know, uh, climatic conditions is a, is a minor point. So um, that's really kind of all the key, um, key items I had, Richard. So happy to save more for Q&A. So thank you very much. Good. And we will have a Q&A afterwards. Good. Um, so let me just take this out here. A lot of what we talk about when it comes to the solutions, when it comes to sustainability and stimulant energy, it's the stuff that we see above the ground. Um, and with some of the things that he's talking about, it's really behind the scenes and has been going for a long time and driving sustainability. So Peter, I'm really looking forward to, to your conversation. Thank you. So thank you. It doesn't have sound maybe. Okay. Oh, no, Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my topic is about uh, hydrogen uh, economy uh, in China and its uh, challenge to foreign companies like us. Uh, first is uh, about uh, the, uh, myself and, uh, and uh, our company. And I have most of my experience in energy industry. So I initially I think uh, the uh, presentation today have a lot of uh, companies from the energy industry. And then I found out a lot of uh, uh, participants are from other industries and so for me I think uh, the energy uh, when we talk about the hydrogen it's mainly from the energy side and I have most of my experience in, in the uh, energy industry first with uh, ABB as a, a core industry uh, core uh, generation clean core and then in nuclear station uh, and then in uh, gas industry so I'm also turning the, uh, the company uh, into, uh, at least in China, into a, a kind of engineering company in energy industry. So the ZBEC was established in, in 67 as a gas separation company, TSA. And along the line, you can see it acquires uh, nine different companies, mainly two groups. One is uh, the lower level is a service company. Uh, to support its growth or the operation business. And top level, there are four companies, uh, mainly the uh, technology companies providing uh, different kind of uh, uh, gases and technologies. And the group established uh, uh, Shanghai operation in 2008. I joined the company in 2014, and then I uh, found a local partner, it's a Shanghai Synergy. Uh, for your uh, understanding, Shanghai Synergy is uh, they supply 40% of the electricity uh, in Shanghai and 95% of the gas in Shanghai. So uh, by have this partner, uh, we are turning Shanghai operation uh, into a kind of uh, energy business or engineering business. 
And you can see uh, we have different uh, product lines and mainly uh, doing all kinds of gas generation and separation. But in China, uh, since 2014, I coming in and I turn in the, uh, the direction of the company and, and moving to the green energy field and mainly in the biogas upgrading uh, to fuel the gas grid. And also uh, in the past four years, we are shifting to the uh, hydrogen. And then I'm talking about the hydrogen economy and it's China's uh, road. And first is why uh, we select hydrogen. And very simple reason because uh, hydrogen is simple and it's renewable. It's one of the most abandoned elements uh, on the earth but it's also very few, uh, almost none in pure form. But you can see we have uh, different sources of getting hydrogen from natural gas doing SMR technology, from renewable sources when we talk about the solar and wind. Like I can think about maybe 13, 10 years ago when I look at the, the solar and the, and the uh, wind, uh, you all know the Shanghai uh, World Expo, when they do the uh, Shanghai World Expo solar panel and the electricity from the panel is about uh, 10 IMB per kilowatt hour. But today, uh, when you get this uh, abandoned uh, power in, in uh, northwest of China and the price is already, let's say, 20 cents or 15 to 20 cents. So uh, it's about the two to three US uh, dollar two to three cents in US dollar. So it's very cheap right now and it's uh, fully affordable. So we can use this to produce hydrogen, almost uh, like free energy. Uh, so that's also one source and the nuclear, like the, the nuclear station I worked in, the Kendu in Canada, they also produce some, they have some uh, hydrogen and also the coal from coal um, chemical. It's a major source in China. And then you ha have all the uh, diverse uh, applications. And now it's a hot point, it's a fuel cell vehicle, but also uh, different uh, uh, fuel cell applications. Also uh, SOFC in energy industry. And then you have a lot of uh, historical ones, uh, like the as a feedstock, as a protection gas, uh, as a uh, chemical adaptive. So mainly you have different end users, different suppliers. So it's widely used. But for your knowledge, uh, the hydrogen as a feedstock, historically, the market is not so big. In China, maybe it's uh, a little over uh, 10 billion IMB. Then we go to hydrogen as an energy. And uh, uh, this one is from uh, Thyssen Group. And they're talking about uh, different sources, just uh, as what I mentioned in different technologies. And when we are also talking about uh, the uh, energy storage and the, the former presenter mentioned uh, uh, the decreasing uh, cost of the battery. And we used to, in, in energy industry, we used to think the battery is still very expensive. So uh, there is always a thinking, can we link this two grid together? Because it's very cheap and easy uh, to store uh, gas. Uh, in the gas grid, uh, but now, uh, as I know, that maybe battery is, can also be a solution, can also be a cheap uh, way of storage. But anyway, when we talk about the hydrogen economy, we think the hydrogen must be from a renewable sources in the near future, and also it for different applications. Uh, right now, we are talking about uh, uh, fuel cell vehicles, and also. We're thinking about uh, the, the load balancing and for the energy storage. Uh, then we have uh, uh, we have a question. When it's already it's too hot uh, a topic for maybe several years already. Uh, not even uh, uh, not only worldwide but also in China. Why we don't see a lot of uh, um, application or uh, a lot of uh, fuel cell vehicles. The problem is the infrastructure is, not, is still not there. We have the production side. It's, it's very easy 
uh, to supply the present amount uh, of the end user. But the problem is the infrastructure is not there and it's very expensive to build. So that's the, uh, one of the biggest barrier right now. But uh, for your information, uh, China has already had a plan uh, about five years ago. Uh, the first uh, blue book was out and it talked about the, the value target, talk about uh, the, the output and talk about energy saving, the emission uh, uh, reduction. At that time, we haven't announced the uh, carbon peaking and the carbon neutral. But then we already have all this uh, um, thinking and uh, about the, the industry manufacturing. I just mentioned when we talk about uh, the hydrogen as a feedstock, the market size is about uh, 10 billion. And then you look at this one. If we talk about it as an energy and thinking of the infrastructure around it and everything, it's over 1,000 billion. It's, it's much huge, 100 times bigger the market. And then we talk about all the supporting systems we need. And this one is around the value chain. We talk about the production and from the gray to the green. And then we talk about the storage and transportation and also the end users. And this one is from uh, uh, another company. And this one uh, focused very much on the fuel cell vehicle uh, value chain. You talk about uh, the number of the vehicles and for 2020, of course, the number, uh, the, the target was not reached. But I'm guessing in the next three years, and it will be accelerated. And when I look back uh, at the solar industry, I'm thinking maybe we are just uh, like uh, the, the, the hydrogen is about maybe 10, 15 years ago of the, uh, the, the, the solar uh, power. And when you look at that time, I think the investment and the cost is maybe 10% uh, of the cost uh, at that time. So I, I'm expecting maybe 10 years of time, uh, we'll see a, a dramatic decrease uh, of the cost, not only the, the fuel cell vehicles, but also uh, we'll see the build up of the, the uh, infrastructure and the decreasing of the, the uh, hydrogen cost. And that's around value chain, and it's the, the figure for China. Right now, we get some uh, hydrogen maybe, uh, today we can get at uh, 35 uh, IMB already. Uh, as I mentioned already, uh, right now, uh, before we have this uh, breakthrough, there are major difficulties. First is the project economy. And presently, a lot of people, a lot of companies talking about uh, hydrogen uh, energy and hydrogen economy, but uh, really it's not an uh, economic thing of doing the projects. And uh, around the value chain, you don't have the economy of skill and the cost is still very high. And without uh, the, uh, even the government to give you the initial uh, subsidy, it's still not enough for you to, to uh, have a sustainable operation for several years. So only the very big companies for political uh, reason, they're they are doing some operation. And the, first, uh, the second thing is the supervision and standards. In a lot of cities you will see, and even the government bodies in charge of the thing is not clear. You have maybe 10, 20 uh, government agents in charge of, uh, in name, in charge of this thing, have their hands and approvals on the project, but no one is taking the leading role. So it's still very difficult. And also the standards are very difficult because um, if you want to establish like in, in Shanghai, in the city, uh, you're not able to find any uh, refilling station in maybe the next year or two years. We have some station uh, outskirts of the city uh, because uh, there are uh, unreasonable distance, uh, they call a safety distance in between and other requirements still regarded as a hazardous uh, chemical or um, facility, not an energy facility. 
So uh, before the standards and the uh, regulations uh, being changed, it's impossible to have this breakthrough very quickly. And the other thing is the business model. Uh, right now, as we mentioned, the value chain, uh, the infrastructure is not there. So for any people who want to be the first mover, they need to help to build the value chain and they need to have a way to cross-subsidize. Otherwise, this business alone cannot sustain. And they also need to, the ability to form the ecosystem, to have all, all the companies around the value chain to work around the uh, same business model. And it's also very difficult to find the right entities doing that uh, because you need to have a deep pocket like uh, state-owned enterprises. But even for them, it's difficult because the central government need them to keep the value of their assets, uh, if not uh, uh, increasing. So for this uh, money losing business at this moment, it's not easy. And then they need to have the advanced technology as some falling companies, and they need to move quickly as a private company. You need to have all this uh, 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 features or the characters to be a, a successful company at this moment. It's not easy. And also you need to have the ability to work with the government, to work with the technology and the capital. You need to have all the elements working. Uh, so uh, at this moment, I still think it's very difficult. We might still need another two to three years to see the breakthrough. But there are already companies doing that. And the reason we find the, the synergy is because if we want to shift to, the, to, to this green energy field, we need to work with uh, the, the party doing the, green, uh, the, the energy utility. And synergy is this kind of utility. So you see they have some investment in, in, in the Mongolia, uh, in, in Gansu province, so it's uh, northwest of China where the electricity is very cheap, so they're doing something. They're doing several cross-subsidize internally. Uh, right now, you know, a lot of investment uh, 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 in these uh, two areas because uh, the, the concession rights or the right to build this, uh, farmers are very, uh, uh, it's, a lot, uh, it's a very valuable. So they get money uh, doing the station and they subsidize their own uh, energy supply chain. When I say it's a state-owned enterprises, means they don't like to do risky things. So what they do is they use a whole bunch of capital people. And, and the initial of the synergy company is a, a, a financial investors owned by the local government to do the, the energy business. So they use this um, advantages again, and uh, like in the pro, uh, on the production uh, uh, chain, they own us. And the delivery storage, they own another local company doing cylinders. And the outlet, like the refilling station, it's heavy assets. They do it by themselves. And the PEM side, uh, they own other two technical companies. They use this quick mover companies and usually smaller companies uh, to penetrate the market. But then they get some funding from, from the other like uh, the, the money making uh, business and they also they work with the local government the government will give them the concession rights the tax rebate the subsidy okay uh, and then they use this money get from the operation or they also ask the local government and uh, this two are the, are the few sale uh, uh, companies so, so they sell to the uh, um, to, the, to the fuel cell vehicle company and they ask uh, the, the mining to turn all their vehicles into fuel cell vehicle. So to do external subsidize. That's the way they are keeping it working. And I, I go very quickly. So what the foreign company can do. And I think right now, uh, because I have only three minutes maybe. So I will tell you, uh, the foreign company, the challenger they have in China is right now, it's very difficult for you to find the good talents. And they're usually taken by top Chinese companies. And the second thing is very difficult to find the capital. And then you also need to have a heavy assets. So you need to find a partner, Chinese partner you can trust. 
and also need to find profitable projects. So those are four key challenges in China. And uh, the ZBEC Shanghai uh, addresses, we have our head office. So give us the foreign technology and we operate as a, a private company. So uh, uh, the, the top management in Shanghai own a little uh, shares of this company and we have uh, SOE resources. So that's the address. But even, th even though we have some uh, problems like the trust between Chinese and foreign shareholders, and also uh, we need to have a check of balance uh, to, to control the senior managers. And the last one uh, asked me to talk about uh, is the foreign company still the leading? Uh, I'm saying uh, presently they are still because China was a LCC country, uh, maybe not, not very much today, and we have insufficient IPR protection. And uh, uh, at that time, we adopted a cost leading uh, strategy. And also, uh, before uh, this uh, trade war, the global industrial division is still functioning. But since the, the China and the US uh, trade war, and also the problem we see the pandemic, the global supply chain, I think uh, now uh, this one will be broken and China is more like in a, a self-sustaining model. So the government uh, have a lot of initiative to uh, encourage the Chinese company to do IND. Uh, and also we have a lot of incentive, like we want to go uh, to, the share, uh, to the stock market. Then we have a requirement, 5% uh, of our uh, uh, revenue will be used uh, in IND. And then there is a lot of collaboration and uh, strengthening uh, IPR protection in China. Due to Chinese companies, some of them are leading. And also it's difficult for Chinese company to get uh, foreign technologies. So I'm saying is, uh, is the foreign companies leading? Uh, they are still, but uh, gradually the gap is narrowing. Uh, it's mainly not uh, the capability issue. It's mainly the return of the investment issue. So I think the gap will be narrowing. So that's all my uh, presentation. Okay. Okay. Before she gets started, I will say, we're gonna be taking a visit to her factory in Fengshan um, next week on Wednesday. So if you wanna see how a solar panel is made, please come and talk to us afterwards. Thank you very yeah. much, Jenna. Thank you. Yeah, I wish it was my factory, but it's Jay <laughs> Solar's factory. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jana. Uh, I'm currently senior sales manager at Jay Solar. Uh, Jay Solar, I will speak about Jay a little bit later. It's one of the uh, biggest uh, PV manufacturing companies in the world. It's uh, last year the force in uh, shipments. Uh, prior to that, I was working at CA. I was working for ND. Um, and uh, I would like to speak to you about uh, the, uh, first, I had a couple of slides, but Andy already has presented them. And uh, what I want to talk about is that the solar is uh, developing very, very fast. And this is one of the leading clean energy technology because the advantage of solar is that you can put it anywhere. You can put it anywhere, it will work in almost all the environmental conditions, it will work everywhere. And uh, the manufacturers are working more and more on improving the quality of the product so it can serve uh, longer and it can work better, perform better, and so on. And the leading <coughs> countries for uh, installing, uh, for installed capacity and also for power generation, as you can see, China, United States, India, Spain, Australia, South Africa, and also you can see here for uh, installed capacity that uh, China US as, as well, uh, Japan, Germany, and uh, some, uh, uh, you can see that there are many uh, European countries. And this is first of all because of the special policies provided by the government. As Andy mentioned already, the, one of the biggest problems of solar is the uh, first 
uh, initial capital that you have to invest in it. And uh, currently businesses uh, are already able to do it on their own, but they still need a lot of support from the government. There are still uh, many, many, many uh, feed-in tariffs, uh, green tariffs, tax incentives in the world. Uh, in all these countries that I mentioned in this uh, uh, table, they are still active and they will act for another, I hope, five to ten mm -hmm. years. And hopefully it will help to, oi, to develop solar further because if you can see here, this is a, a renewable energy consumption by source from 2010 and solar is only 3.3%. This is very, very, very small, but if you can see further now, uh, for the results of 2020, it's only 25.3%. So the, the growth is dramatic. It's very significant and it's going to grow even more and more. Uh, I would like to talk about some challenges and opportunities for module manufacturing that uh, we are facing and the industry is facing. <coughs> so. Regarding R&D, that is a higher cell efficiency, uh, and I want to talk about cell efficiency and uh, module size control as well, because if you, if I have picture here, um, if you see maybe here, you see like a lot of white spaces in the module, but if you can see here, yeah, here a lot of uh, white, white spaces in the module. Here there is no white space in the module. This, is, this depends on the, the area of the module and the efficiency the module can provide. The, the, now the challenge for the manufacturer is that we don't want to grow the size of the module, so we want to improve the area that can be covered by solar cells, and we don't want to, pro to have empty space in the module so th therefore we can have higher power output of the modules. So this is one of our uh, main challenges uh, because currently the industry, what is happening is that the, the module size is growing and while it's for utility scale, it, it's not such a big issue, but for residential, uh, it's, a, it's a big issue because you cannot put uh, as much weight on your roof as you want. There are some restrictions, but obviously you, have, you want to have more and more power. So this is one of our challenges. Uh, another challenge is a degradation. Uh, the modules, are de uh, they can degrade, degrade in the first year up to 2 or 2.5%. And then uh, now the manufacturers are trying to implement uh, multiple technologies to, uh, to not to let it happen. Uh, I will talk about uh, some of them later. Uh, module design as well. Now uh, the customers, they are becoming more and more <coughs> dependent in terms of how the module looks, what the module size is. And then like the manufacturers, we have to be very careful about what we are selling and what we are offering to our clients because uh, the uh, clients are becoming more and more demanding uh, in terms of module design, especially for rooftop applications. Like for example, in Europe, uh, in the markets where I'm working now, it's uh, Northwest Europe, the utility scale and project is not very, uh, very developed, is not as developed as uh, rooftop applications. And for rooftop applications, the uh, end customer is any of us, and the people, they are becoming more demanding on this. So module, uh, module suppliers also have to face it. Um, and uh, another, a challenge and opportunity is a higher reliability of the module. Because, yes, you can put module in any environmental condition you, you, you want, but it doesn't mean that it will work very long. So you have to improve the module reliability in, uh, in order to be able to use it anywhere you want. For example, one of the uh, main trends now in solar is floating solar. Because we have a lot of rivers, we have a lot of lakes, and uh, one of the best applications currently is hydropower stations. Uh, you can put solar on there and it, it can work. But because of the special environment, this is water, humidity, 
uh, it's difficult in operation maintenance and also the reliability of your module has to be much better. So, your, so module manufacturers, we have to work on it. And of course, uh, we are also facing the challenges in cost control, uh, but our challenges are not so much. The three main challenges are raw material pricing that we cannot control. We have to go to what we are offered from our raw material suppliers, shipment cost, uh, and uh, manufacturing cost control for operation maintenance of our factories and the construction of new factories. And for the next one, uh, if we talk about high raw material price, for example, right now uh, in the industry, the challenge is that the prices are going up uh, for solar and they are going to be going up for for another half a year or maybe for another year because of the polysilicon supply shortage. And uh, uh, we have to increase the prices because of that. And some of our customers, they cannot build their project. They have to postpone it or uh, even uh, cancel the project because they cannot meet their budgets. So this is one of the challenges we are facing now. And also aluminum and silver prices are going up. And we have, to, we have to take it. And then the end customer has to take it as well. Uh, another big challenge now is the shipment cost. Uh, due to coronavirus, uh, a lot of people are uh, sitting at home. And they are ordering a lot of goods from all over the world. Uh, this might sound silly, but this is one of the reasons that the uh, CEO of one of the biggest uh, shipment companies in Europe named at the uh, uh, cost, uh, shipment cost increase. And then because of the, so the trade, the shipment has become more intensive now. That's why for our regular shipment, there are no enough containers, no enough vessels available. So if you want to ship something, you have to pay much higher than you used to pay. And of course it goes into the end price and we are going to the the same problem that uh, the price for uh, solar power is for solar modules now is increasing a lot. And basically for all the uh, elements that are required for the PV power station. Uh, and then again, it's lack of financing. So we are facing project delays. Uh, supply demand balance is very, very, very thin now. And uh, um, there are, as I mentioned before, the, some uh, supportive policies are being cancelled. And some of the companies that have grown on this support and this policy incentives, they are falling behind now. And they have to find some other support that they cannot get from uh, government anymore. And some trade barriers that uh, we are facing, for example, with trade with the United States. And uh, I want to talk now a little bit, I now spoke of the challenges of the industry. Now I want to speak how uh, the companies the, are solving it, uh, and especially J Solar as being one of the biggest uh, manufacturers in the world. So we have shipped as, for, as of Q4 2020, 63 gigawatts of modules. And uh, J is a very, very, very big company, and one of the first major players in PV industry. And uh, we are going to have, by the end of 2021, uh, this match capacity, 30 gigawatts of wafers, 30 gigawatts of cells, 40 gigawatts of modules of our own production, of our own facilities that we are going to offer. To, for a comparison, right now we are having 22. Another 3.5 gigawatts is in construction. Uh, as for per today, but we are going to basically double it next year because we are expecting very, very, very uh, big growth of the demand. This is our, we are based everywhere in the world, basically. Uh, we have uh, headquarters in Beijing, sales center here in Shanghai, and our sales offices in many other countries. And as you can see, our main market is China, obviously, because it's a big 
the biggest demand is coming from China, then uh, a lot of demand is coming now from East Asia and Pacific, from India, Vietnam. This uh, market is develop developing very, very, very fast. Uh, and uh, it's very uh, easy to work with them. Uh, also, we are basically now working with three types of uh, users of solar. This is uh, for solar plant or utility scale, we call it. The big projects, commercial rooftop. This is very popular now for uh, the companies that Andy mentioned. Uh, Google, Microsoft, Starbucks, they are they want to be sustainable, so that's why they are using uh, the solar on their facilities. And uh, especially, it's very, very po popular in Europe. And uh, a residential rooftop is basically for like end user. Uh, then uh, I would like to talk about technology uh, very, very, very briefly. So uh, we have two main technologies, thin film and polysilicon uh, based PV. So uh, the uh, thin film is not so popular and there are two or three suppliers of thin film in the world. The most popular is uh, uh, polysil uh, polysilicon suppliers and there is a P-type and N-type so-called. There's, there's a difference in the, the, the chemistry in how you make cells and then the so P-type is degradating faster than N-type. Uh, I will speak about it a little bit later. So here I would like to, to, uh, to talk about that we have now three main mainstream products in the entire industry. Is that uh, d depends on the size of the wafer, 158, 166, 182. I mean cell in, inside of the module. And then I mentioned we are trying to make the cell larger, but the module not so big, so it can be, it still can be used. Uh, and uh, what we are trying to do, we're trying to achieve lower degradation. Uh, this so-called, uh, recently there has been a major progress in this uh, called uh, gallium daped, uh, doped uh, uh, wafer that uh, now allows uh, us to give warranty uh, much longer than we used to give because warranty is very important for the project because we are promising that you can use your uh, PV module for 25 years. Now we can say you can use it for 30 years. And uh, so it's uh, really, so that's why we really need to work on reliability and different technologies. And this is, for example, now the more the main strip module that you can see in the market with the 182 size cell. These modules are very big. They're like, I don't know, this size, they're very big. Comparing to like what was before is like maybe this, my height, but now it's like higher than Andy. <laughs> and then, uh, so this is one of the challenges that also we are facing with the module size. We cannot keep just growing it. We need to find another solution that we are finding other solutions with N-type. We are finding other solutions with gallium doped wafers. Uh, we are using different technologies to improve modules. And uh, for example, one of the solutions shingle module where you are basically, you are not connecting your cells, but you're putting them one onto, in, uh, onto each other and then this is how you save the space, but generate higher power output. But this technology, we call it new technology, but actually this technology is coming from like 80s. It's like all new is good old. Um, and uh, this is how you can keep your module smaller, but, uh, and the same, so you, if you have a smaller module, you need less land, less uh, labor, less everything. And another solution that we are having is N-type module that they, uh, uh, so the, one of the major uh, advantages of N-type module is uh, that the degradation during the first year is, almost does not exist. And uh, uh, so the, the you have, 
you have more advantages in the power generation and also it can generate uh, more power output. Also it's more reliable than the standard uh, P-type module. The problem is that uh, it's not going to, even though the suppliers are claiming that it's already in mass production, it's kind of not because it's, uh, uh, there is no such a, a huge demand for it and uh, there's no point for us to produce it a large scale. There's a very a big demand from China, but from other countries not very much because it's very expensive to produce now. We expect that it will be mainstream product maybe in five years if the technology allow us to develop so fast and to adjust our production lines. Uh, so this is all from my side. Thank you. You can stay up here and Andy and Peter.